Good evening, friends. It's good to be with you this evening. I would have liked to have been actually with you face to face and enjoy the fellowship that we have enjoyed in the past times, but uh, we're stuck with where we are now uh, for the time being. And I do pray that the Lord is blessing you and you've known the Lord's hand upon you over these difficult times. And it's good to be able to turn to the Word of God in times like this, whenever things are difficult, and to be reminded indeed that we have a God who is eternal, who is ever present, and who has given us word, his word for this time, and uh, a word whereby we may be built up, uh, be comforted and guided and directed, and God's word is truth, and we thank God for the privilege we have of still being able to proclaim that word, and to know that we can depend on that word without a time whenever man's word is not to be trusted very often but god's word is always to be trusted and we thank thank god that he has given us his word and so as we look at his word this evening i want to begin uh, a little series of four on the first chapter of the revelation this revelation is a, a very neglected book and uh, much disputed by theologians and uh, indeed, whenever I uh, was training way back in the in the eighties, the early eighties, um, there was thought by some theologians that there was so much symbolism in the Book of the Revelation it was impossible to understand. But I think we'll see this evening that that's not the case, and God has told us directly uh, that we are to understand this book. And what I want to do this evening is to read through the first chapter. But I'm only going to speak on the first three verses of the chapter. But the, reading the first chapter will give us an oversight of uh, what this chapter is about. And indeed, what the whole book is about. This first chapter is a key to the whole book of the Revelation. And uh, it's important for us to realize that and know what God has revealed concerning uh, what's happening today. And what is going to happen, especially when the church is taken out. Uh, we'll not be looking at that section of Revelation. We're only looking at the introduction. And uh, I trust and pray that the Lord will bless us. Uh, if you wanted a, seri a, a title for the series uh, for the four weeks, it would be The Unveiling of Jesus Christ, because that's what the book is about. So we're going to read the first chapter, the Revelation in chapter 1, and commencing to read at verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God, and of the testimony of Jesus Christ, and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion for ever and ever. Amen. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. And all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, Amen. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and heard behind me a great voice as of a, th of a trumpet, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and not to Sardis, and not to Philadelphia, and not to Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. 
His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive for evermore. Amen, and have the keys of hell and of death. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest, are the seven churches. Amen. We trust the Lord will richly bless the reading of his precious word to all our hearts. As I say, this book of the Revelation is a very important book uh, for believers today. It's very much up to date with what's happening at this present time. When you look at the second and third chapters, you see the condition of the churches uh, that we find in Asia. They were all churches that were chosen, uh, I believe, because of the character, the particular character of those churches. And uh, indeed, uh, many writers have uh, acquainted these seven churches with seven uh, ages of the church age. And I don't think it's too hard to see that when you look back in the history of the church and you see the different uh, particular characteristics at particular times, but we must understand that these were seven literal churches and they were chosen, I believe, to represent all the churches of all ages because these characteristics were uh, in existence uh, in the first century of the church and they're very much still in existence today in the churches of Jesus Christ. And we feel perhaps that uh, prophetically speaking, that we are in the what we call the Laodicean age, a, a day of lukewarmness, when many of God's people uh, are drifting along and uh, there's a lack of zeal and enthusiasm for spiritual things. And some of that is because of the pressures that are being placed uh, upon the church by the world in these times. There's uh, almost like a, a falling away, a coldness a setting in, and God refers to it as a lukewarmness. And that we are in that dangerous time, I believe, a time which which is preceding, I, I believe, the imminent return of the Lord Jesus Christ. But as we begin to look at this first chapter, I want us to look at several things in these three verses that we want to look at. The first thing I want to notice is the centrality of the Lord, of the person, the Lord Jesus Christ, the centrality of the person. And we find that in the opening expression of uh, Revelation chapter 1 in the very first verse we're told here in the opening phrase the revelation of Jesus Christ now the word revelation that we have here is the word in the Greek apocalypse from which we get our word apocalypse now I'm sure you've heard of uh, sometimes if there's a tragedy happens a, a tsunami or an earthquake or uh, great floods that have happened uh, down through the years, many of the commentators will refer to them as incidents of apocalyptic proportions. And sometimes the word apocalypse has come to be understood as uh, uh, some event or, or some tragic happening. But in actual fact, the word apocalypse means an unveiling. And the book of the Revelation is a book of unveiling. And we're told here specifically that it's an unveiling of Jesus Christ. Now that's what makes this book vitally important. And sadly over the years because of uh, doctrinal differences and theological differences and uh, arguments that have uh, raged over the years over this book uh, and gone into the symbolism and the things that are happening that are revealed in it and differences of opinion uh, the fact that this is a revelation of Jesus Christ seems to have been lost by and large by many. This book is about the person of our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, the one that we will soon, I'm sure, uh, see in all his glory, as I believe that we are very, very close to that 
moment in time that was promised to us. Uh, we see it revealed in First Thessalonians chapter 4, how the Paul says that the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel. And there'll be no warning of that. Uh, Paul says again in 1 Corinthians 15, it'll be in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. And so we are looking up and we're watching for the Lord Jesus Christ coming. And this book is centered upon the person of Jesus Christ. It's the revelation, the unveiling of Jesus Christ. And if we consider the titles that are given to our Lord in this book, it becomes very clear. For instance, the, la the, the title of the Lamb of God is used some 28 times in this book. And then you have other uh, titles that are given to our Lord. For instance, in Revelation uh, chapter 1 here that we're in, and in verse 5, he's described as Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth. And those are titles that are ascribed to our Lord Jesus Christ. In chapter, or verse 8, rather, of chapter 1, says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord. And then it says at the very end of the verse, the Almighty. These are wonderful uh, titles and descriptions and characteristics of our Lord Jesus Christ. And in verse 17 to 18 of this chapter, again, he repeats again, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Beloved, this is our Savior. And these are wonderful things that we see about him in the book, this book of the Revelation. This is how he reveals himself. And at a time in which we're living, we need to be reminded of these things. We need to be reminded that he is indeed the Almighty. And that means that there's no one more mightier than he. There's no more one more, no one more powerful than he. He's our blessed Savior. And he's the one that we're looking for. We're, I believe we're going to see him soon. And we ought to be taking our eyes off what's happening around the world today where man is struggling and there's chaos everywhere and, and, and we, we can hardly believe anything that man is saying in these days because each man is seeking their own way and they're doing their own thing. But we're trusting in the Lord and this is a wonderful revelation that we have of our blessed Saviour. If we went on through the book in chapter 3, he's called the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. In chapter 5, he's described as the lion of the tribe of Judah and the root of David. And even coming towards the end of the book in chapter 15, he is described again as the lamb in verse 3. And the Lord God Almighty and the King of Saints. In chapter 19, verse 16, he's described as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You know, friends, there's nobody in this world is worthy of these titles and descriptions uh, as our blessed Lord and Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ is. And what a blessing it is to know him in a personal way, to be saved by grace, to be redeemed by his precious blood and to be joined to him eternally. Yes, even in this life, we are in Christ. And this is the one that is being described here in this book. And it's exciting. The very opening phrase of this book ought to be exciting for any true child of God. An unveiling, taking the veil off the person of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that should immediately uh, excite our hearts and our minds to know more about what this unveiling is all about. And so we see the centrality of the person of Jesus Christ, even in the titles and the names that we read of him. But I want you to notice here in this verse, it says it's a revelation, an unveiling, which God, now that's speaking, of course, of God the Father, which God gave unto him. Now that reminds us that the Lord Jesus Christ left the glory of heaven. He is the Son of the eternal Son of God, and he came down to earth, and he was born of a virgin. God became flesh. The Son of God became the Son of Man. He voluntarily uh, submitted himself to the Father. And we read that wonderful portion, Philippians chapter 2, of how being the form of God, he thought, himself, thought not robbery to be equal with God, 
but made himself of no reputation and took upon himself the form of man and being found in fashion as a man he humbled himself and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross and beloved he subjected himself uh, to the father in a wonderful way he didn't cease to be god he had all the attributes of Godhead. He had all the characteristics of God. He never ceased to be God, and yet he became something that he wasn't before. And he submitted himself to the Father throughout his life. When we read in John's Gospel, of course, John is the writer of the book of the Revelation here. But in John's Gospel especially, the Lord makes many, many references to his relationship with the Father. For instance, John three thirty four says, For he whom God has sent speaketh, the words of God. For God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. The Father loveth the Son and hath given all things into his hand. The Father loveth the Son and the Son loves the Father. And the Son has sub submitted himself to the Father. And this is a wonderful truth. John 5 verse 20 says, For the Father loveth the Son and showeth him all things that himself doeth. And he will show him greater works than these, that ye may marvel. For as the Father raiseth up the dead and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. You see, he never, he never lost his power as God, but he chose in submission to the Father in becoming the Son of Man to redeem men. He chose to not use those attributes of, of divinity for himself, but he never ceased to be God. He submitted himself to the Father. He came to do the Father's will. And if we read through carefully through John's Gospel, we see many, many references to that. For instance, in John 12 and verse 49, he says, For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me, he gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. And so the Lord Jesus Christ walked this scene of time. And as he walked this scene of time, he walked in in complete and perfect obedience to the Father, speaking the things the Father gave him to speak and doing the things the Father gave him to do. And so therefore we see this wonderful person of the Lord Jesus Christ. We see him, uh, him in his names and in his titles, and we see him indeed uh, being uh, under submission to the Father. And even here, when he is given this revelation he's given it by the father to reveal it to us and you know it reminds me of you remember in acts chapter one whenever he was about to ascend to the father again and they'd gathered his disciples around him and then uh, the disciples asked the question uh, when if, whenever he was going to come back again and when these things would begin to uh, the things that he taught them would begin to take place and the, and the Lord told his disciples that it wasn't for them to know the times and the seasons which God had put in his own power. In other words, this wasn't the time for those things that the disciples were inquiring about uh, to be made known. But now when we come many years later, this, is, this book was written, the book of the Revelation was written about, uh, and about 90 AD or 95 AD, around about that particular time. So some uh, 90 years later, or, or 70 years later rather, whenever uh, this book was given uh, to John. And so this is the time that these things are to be revealed. And uh, the, the, the Father is giving this revelation to the Son, uh, and he is the center of this book. And this is why it's so important. But I want you to notice not only the centrality of the person of this book, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, but I want you to notice also the clarity of the purpose. Because we're told here that the rev this is the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. The purpose of this book is to show unto his servants the things which must shortly come to pass. Now that doesn't indicate to me that this is a book that cannot be understood by God's people. In fact, to the contrary, we're told that this is a book that was given to the Son, that he might give it to his servants, that they may know the things which must shortly come to pass. Now, of course, we might immediately, the first thing we think about when we think of his servants, we think of the church of Jesus Christ. 
And of course that is true. But I believe it's given to all the saints. You see, in the second and third chapters, we see each to each letter there's written to each church. It wasn't just for that particular church. But when you read down chapters 2 and 3, you, you find in several places where this, this little phrase, uh, that what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And on each occasion, for each letter, we find that phrase, what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And over and over and over for each of the seven churches, these letters were for all the churches. Though they were addressed to particular churches, they were for all the churches. And so we see this wonderful clarity of purpose. This book is to be so that the Lord would show to his servants the things which must shortly come to pass. The word show here is a word to verbally and visually show. Now, of course, we have it before us uh, in the book, the Word of God. It's the book of the Revelation. We have it in black and white before us. But, of course, there is symbolism in this book. And the word to show means to show verbally and visually. And there are many visual expressions of what's going to happen in this book in the future. And now I'm not saying it's an easy book, but it's a book that is to be understood and for those who are willing to study, those who are willing to be students of the word and to seek out the truth, God will reveal the meaning of these things to those who are earnest and those who depend upon him and seek his face. And so it's an exciting book. And I know in my younger Christian days, I couldn't understand this book. And indeed, there are many things that are still uh, that I sometimes I feel it's this and then I believe it's that and uh, sometimes I'm changing my mind and it, it can be a difficult book and yet you know we can look at a particular incident in, in the book and there may be two or three or maybe more ways of looking at the thing but you know all the time that we study it we are becoming more and more convinced of what the Lord is trying to say to us and so the Lord does open up his word to us but we must take the time we must have the desire and take the time because it's a book for you and it's a book for me because we belong to the Lord. We are his servants. And we're told here in the very opening words that this book was to show unto the servants of the Lord Jesus Christ things which must shortly come to pass. Now this word shortly doesn't mean immediately. The word shortly has the sense of uh, imminency. It means that whenever the things in this book begin to happen, and I begin believe that uh, the, the part relevant to the world uh, begins in, in chapter 6. Because in chapters 2 and 3 you have the letters to the churches. And then John is called up into heaven in chapter 4. And we find the church represented there by the 24 elders uh, in chapter 5. And, and you know, uh, we, we have that scene in heaven that moves from... The world here in the churches in chapters 2 and 3 and the scene moves to heaven in chapters 4 and 5. And then as the Lord opens the seals in, in chapter 6, then we see things beginning to happen on the earth again. And you know, it's a, it is indeed a wonderful book. But the clarity of the purpose is that this book is to be shown, these things, this, this revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ is to be shown to us today. And we are living at a time when we ought to understand the things that God has revealed to us. Now, I want you to notice thirdly here the content of this proclamation. The content of this proclamation. You see, this word, when it came through the Apostle John and the Isle of Patmos, this is a word of prophecy. This is a foretelling of things that are coming to pass. It says things which must shortly come to pass. They haven't taken place yet. And so the content of this proclamation is prophecy. And we could go through many verses in this uh, book. And it's speaking of things that are to come and it, came, and it will come to pass. Because God's word is true. And God will fulfill his word. We see first of all here that the content of this proclamation, it is the word of God. 
This is not the word of man. I want you to notice here in verse 2. Uh, well, first of all, notice at the end of verse 1 it says, And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. This is carrying the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ who received this word from the Father and he's sending it by his messenger, by his angel and he's giving it to John. John is chosen as the one responsible for recording these wonderful things that the Father is uncovering or unveiling about his son Jesus Christ. Jesus wasn't allowed to give these things Whenever he was walking in this scene of time, he said on one occasion in Mark's gospel, No man knoweth the hour, neither the angels in heaven, neither the Son. At that moment in time, it wasn't that he didn't know what was going to happen in the future, but being submissive to the Father, he was only revealing those things that the Father had given him to reveal. He was perfectly uh, obedient to the Father's will. And that's why he wasn't to give the, the, these things. But God is giving them to him now. And he is signifying it by an angel to his servant John who will record these things. Because it says in verse 2, who bear record of the word of God. And there we have the authority for this book. Now those people who stay clear of the book of the Revelation, those people who never read it, who have no interest in it, we must realize that that means that we're denying or neglecting the word of God. This is the word of God. And we say that if we believe that the Bible is the word of God, then we must include this book of the Revelation because it tells us very specifically that John bear a record of the word of God. Now we are to be obedient to the word of God and we can't be obedient to the word of God if we don't know the word of God. And so it's important for us to read this book. We may find it difficult when we begin to read it. But the more you read it and the more you pray that the Lord will reveal these things to you, the more precious it will become, the more precious it will become to each one of us as we spend time in the word. It is the word of God. It has the authority of God. The psalmist says in Psalm 68 verse 11, The Lord gave the word. Great was the company of those that published it. This book that we have in our hands tonight, it is the word of God from Genesis to Revelation. And there's no part of this book, there's no book contained in this book that we ought to neglect. We ought to be reading through the word of God and studying those things that God leads us to study and apply ourselves to it. It is the word of God. But also, that's the authority for this book. It's the word of God. But also, I want you to notice the mystery of this book because it is the witness of Jesus Christ. Look at what uh, John records here. It says, Who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ. This reaffirms to us that this is a book which is about our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. It is his testimony. It is his witness. He speaks in this book. And you know, friends, the spirit of prophecy is the Lord Jesus Christ. He, this book, from Genesis to Revelation, this book is all about Jesus Christ. From the very beginning, when God said to Adam and Eve in the garden that the seed of the woman would crush the serpent's head. And we, we begin to see a revelation of the Messiah in the word of God from Genesis right through. Uh, it's revealed to us very quickly that uh, not only will he be a man, but he'll be descended from Abraham. And then we, we read later on that he's going to be of the line of David. And of course, when the announcement came, we are told that he would sit on the throne of his father, David. And there are many other scriptures that we could link together and see the, the, the Lord Jesus Christ traced through the scripture. But this is the final unveiling of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why it's exciting. This is tremendous, this book. And, and we ought to be excited about it. John bear record of the word of God. That's the authority. And the wonderful mystery is the unveiling. A mystery in the Bible is something that was previously hidden, but now is being revealed. And of course, because it's being revealed, it's, it's being revealed to us. 
uh, and that the Spirit of God is the one who enlightens us that we might understand. So it's a, a testimony of Jesus Christ. But also notice it's a prophecy because we, we, we read that these are wonders. Look, look at what it says. It says that uh, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. You know, beloved, these are things that are revealed to us that we may know. These are things that have been seen. These are things that we have to know. In Revelation chapter 22 and verse 8, almost at the end of this book of the Revelation, it says that, jo that I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. And of course, we read in, that, uh, in, the, in the next verse to that, that the angel rebuked him and he told him to worship God. Because angels don't receive worship. The only one that receives worship is God. But John says that the things that he saw and the things that he heard caused him to fall down and worship before, before God. And beloved, this book will encourage us. It will drive us to worship God as, as God reveals himself in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is a tremendous thing. This is the content of this book. It will drive us to the feet of our God to worship and to praise and to thank him for all that he has done for us and all that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to do. When, when the church is taken out and we begin to read about the seal judgments and, the, and the, the vile judgments and trumpet judgments and all those judgments that are going to take place, you know, beloved, it causes us to wonder at the mighty power of our God. There's no one can stand before him. He is the Almighty. And these things are revealed to us that we might be encouraged. And you know, when we come to the end of this book in verse, 20, in verse 10 of chapter 22, we read a little phrase, the time is at hand. The time is at hand. And you, beloved, although 2,000 years have passed, we are waiting expectantly for the Lord to come to the air for us at any moment. And we have to confess the time is at hand. He can come today. He can come tonight. And we must be ready. And when he does come, if he were to come tonight, even as we're speaking, the things that are revealed from chapter 6 onwards of this book, they will begin to happen very, very quickly. The people in the world won't have time to, come to reconcile the disappearance of millions of believers out of this world. They won't have time to repent. They won't have time to call upon the Lord because these things will happen very, very quickly. And that's why we need to be telling our friends, telling our family about the Lord Jesus Christ, warning them that the time is at hand. And they may mock and they may laugh, but we know that can happen in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, quick as a blink, we'll be away. And those who are not saved, those who have never trusted Christ, will be left behind. And that's why believers need to read this book and be enlightened and be aware of what's going to happen. But you know, in this, just to close off for tonight, our time is nearly gone, but just to close off for tonight, notice the comfort of the promise that we find in verse 3. The comfort of the promise. We've seen the centrality of the person, the clarity of the purpose and the content of the proclamation. But look at the comfort of the promise that we find in verse 3. It says, Blessed is he that readeth. There's a beatitude here. When we talk of beatitudes, we often think of the, uh, the kingdom parables, the, the Sermon on the Mount, and all the things that the, the Lord spoke about in the Sermon on the Mount. And he began those with beatitude, with beatitudes. But here at the beginning of this book, it starts off with a beatitude. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. There's that expression again, the time is at hand. And you know, beloved, there are actually seven beatitudes, seven blessings in this book. Let me just give them to you very briefly. I can't take time to dwell upon them. But we have the first one here in this verse that we have been reading in verse 3. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein. 
And then we find in chapter 14 and verse 13, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. And then we go on again to uh, chapter 16 and verse 18. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments. Verse, chapter 19 and verse 9. Blessed are they who are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. Chapter 20 verse 6. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. Chapter 22 verse 7. Blessed is he that keepeth the words of the prophecy of this book. Chapter 22 and verse 14, blessed are they that wash their robes. And you know, dear friends, these are, there are blessings in this book. You know, there'll be, there'll be those who'll be saved during the great tribulation, those who have never heard the gospel, never had opportunity to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and the gospel of Christ. And they'll hear the gospel of the kingdom during the tribulation period. And there'll be many who will turn and put their trust in the Lord. And these blessings are given that those uh, tribulation saints might be encouraged and comforted in the knowledge that there's blessings for them. Even though they may pay for their testimony with their lives, yet there's blessings for them from the Lord. And this is a word of great uh, encouragement to those tribulation saints. But you know, it says here that there's a blessing for those who read this book says, blessed is he that readeth. Now that's contrary to what many people would say about it. So you should, uh, you, they can't read the book because it's impossible to understand it. But there's a blessing even to read the book, let alone study it and understand it. Blessed are they that read. That's a, a promise from the Lord. There's a blessing if you sit down and you begin to read this book, there's a blessing for you. That's the promise of God. But not only is the blessing to those that read, but they that hear the words of the prophecy. You see, if you, pro if you approach this book with, uh, with the idea or the thought or the condition of mind or heart that you're only reading it because you've been reading through the rest of the Bible and you have to finish the Bible or reading it for some uh, light purpose, you know, there may be some blessing for you, but you're going to lose out because it says, blessed is he that readeth and they that hear. In other words, when we begin to read this book, we want to understand it. We want to hear what God would say to us. Hearing is so important. And, and, and it's, um, uh, when you come to the end of this book, in, verse, in chapter 22, verse 7, it says, Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Now, you can't keep the sayings of the prophecy of this book if you don't hear them. We've got to give ourselves to reading. And we've got to ask the Lord to open our ear as, as the, the servant of the Lord. And Isaiah prayed, he, he said, He opened up my ear morning by morning. And beloved, we need to ask God to open our ear to hear what he has to say to us. And there'll be a blessing for us if we do that. Blessed is he that readeth, and blessed are they that uh, hear the words of this prophecy. And it says, blessed are those that keep those things which are written therein. Now this is true of all scripture. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. As God breathed and is profitable. And that's no less true of this book than the Revelation. There's a blessing to read it. There's a blessing in hearing it. But there's the greatest blessing of all if we keep the things, if we believe the things that are written in this book. If we allow that word to get into our hearts and into our minds and to change our attitude and to encourage us to worship, to praise and to thank God. There's a blessing for us. That's the promise of God. God doesn't lie. And we're losing out on blessing if we neglect this book. And let me remind you, we lose out on the blessing because this book is about the one whom we call Savior. The one whom we call the lover of our souls. The one of whom we say, who loved us and gave himself for us. He gave his life for us. He shed his precious blood for us. And now God is taking the veil away from his blessed son, our Savior. He's allowing us to see behind the veil. 
of what's going to happen. You see, John announced in John's gospel, we hear the cry of John the Baptist, behold, the Lamb of God. And when we think of a lamb, we think of somewhat uh, an animal that is very helpless. But he became the Lamb of God to when he comes again. You see, beloved, when he comes again, he's going to come as a lion of the tribe of Judah. The book of the Revelation tells us of those who flee from the wrath of the Lamb. And he's going to be revealed as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, a lion of the tribe of Judah. And these are wonderful things to know and understand. We don't serve a dead Savior. We serve a risen Savior. He's sitting at the right hand of God and he's just waiting for the command to come forth and catch away his bride. Beloved, I hope that this has whetted your appetite to hear what is going to be revealed in the rest of this chapter, never mind the rest of the book. It's a wonderful chapter and I trust and pray you'll come back again to listen to what God has to say as we look over these next few weeks at the remainder of this chapter of the unveiling of our blessed Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. May the Lord bless his word to our hearts. And let's just bow for a moment of prayer and ask God to bless us as we continue in these studies. Our Father, we thank and praise thee for all thy goodness and grace and giving us thy word and giving us thy spirit that he may teach us and give us understanding of these things. We realize that the natural man cannot understand the things of God. But Lord, we thank you that we have received of thy spirit and he's the only one who understands the mind of God. He's the one who has given us this word and he's the one who gives us understanding. So we pray that you'll stir our hearts, open our understanding, open our ears to hear and grant Lord by the help of the Holy Spirit we will put into practice the things that we read in thy word. Do bless us, our Father, we pray. Be bless thy people. Watch over us in these times. Take care of us. Protect us from this old virus that's going around. And grant our Father indeed that your people may know the blessing of the Lord in these difficult times. And may they know that peace that passes all understanding through Jesus Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. And amen. Well, thanks once again for gathering to Listen to the word of God and I pray it may be of some blessing and help to you in the days to come. Amen.